Hello, hi there. Many thanks for joining us for this edition of 21 Minutes with KKB. My name is Kwabna Chenchehene Boatin. Today I'm speaking to a gentleman who has uh, seen it all, if I should put it that way. He's, uh, he's held several positions in governance and he's done a lot to uh, project a lot of candidates and a lot of presidents. Now he's seeking the mandate. He wants to be the one to run the show. I'll return in a bit to introduce my guest for today. Stay with us. Dr. Ekospio Gabra is my guest today on 21 Minutes with KKB. Doc, good to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start off with this before we even delve into anything. The, is, is it an honorary title, the doc? That is correct. Oh, it is. Okay, okay. So it's, it's always gotten me a bit confused at a certain point in time. I just had to clear that. Okay. Um, let's start off with uh, your, the history. You've done a lot. You've been... Minister for Trade, Minister for Education, Minister for... I, I mean, you've, you've seen it all. What more do you seek? Why do you want to be president? Well, maybe your statement about I've see, seen it all is not exactly complete. Okay. Because, as you've just implied, I've not seen the position of a vice president. I've not experienced the position of a president. Mm -hmm. And indeed, to have seen most things in life in terms of the variety of occupations and professions that I've pursued or have been privileged by God's grace to experience, people will ask you along the lines. And indeed, it just so happens that almost everybody who has been my supervisor at one time or the other, going back more than 30 years, has asked me whether based on the efficiency and the competencies and the ideas that I had and have, whether I've thought of any leadership position in my country. But it's all coming about because of the pressure people began to give to you, suggestions that, you know what, you look like a good leader, why don't you stand for this, why don't you do that? I won't call it pressure, it's conversations that take place and then self-recognition. Why did it have to take you so long to declare your intention to be president I of I don't Ghana? think it has taken so long. I don't know whether, I, I know you're a young man, but in 19, mm -hmm. in 2006, if you look at this brochure, when I was mm -hmm. a much younger man. Yeah, much way started, younger. I, I, <laughs> I presented myself to the people of Ghana as a potential leader of this country. So mm -hmm. this is not something that is new. Mm -hmm. At that time, unlike most other people who present themselves mm -hmm. for leadership and don't even tell you what their vision so is. So you had a vision at the time. Can I have a look document. at that? There's a whole document That's about fine. my vision mm. for Ghana, my vision for the NDC, which is the party, my, my vision for the presidency, the seat itself, that job. If you get that job, how would you manage it? All is that is in writing. Mm. So it's not something that has just happened overnight. But as I said, it's taken a number of years, maybe decades of all kinds of incidents and suggestions here and there until I said to myself that President Mills actually was the one that said this to me numerous times when he himself was a candidate and when I was campaigning for him, when I was director of communication for him. And he would call me and say this to me and with other people sometimes listening that if at any time I can't pursue this agenda, you're the only person I'm going to support. And I said, Mr. <laughs> Mr. President, please. I mean, we are campaigning for you, so let's go ahead. So I guess my error, technical error, was in 2006, when because of what he'd said, and when he himself ad admitted that he was not too well, then I said, well, maybe this is the time he wanted me to come forward mm -hmm. and offer myself as a leader. But apparently the party thought otherwise. And um, so he won the flag race, mm -hmm. and we came and supported him. I campaigned for him, raised a lot of money for him. I was very surprised. Mm -hmm. And he told everybody that he had said, he had said to people in 2003, when I was going to take the job of chief executive of the Commonwealth Telecom Organization, and I quote him that when I become president in 2004, Ekospio Gabra is the first person I shall appoint as a minister in my government. Now, I do know why he, he would say that. And many people were a little surprised, some were not happy that President Mills said that. So if somebody who has worked with many people Besides that, of all the people I've worked with, this is the person I think can do this or that. All that helps to make you, you don't get a, heavy, a heavy head, but you, you feel that it's a responsibility that is mm. being, being laid on you. You, you were a minister under the Eswar Mahama government, and one of the key things that a lot of people said probably led to John Mahama being kicked out of office was the fact that he couldn't deliver on a lot of promises. Uh, he said a lot of things, uh, or he tried doing certain things, but in the end, they didn't really come out the way and manner in which he expected. One of them was uh, uh, the government's inability to stick to certain timelines as to 
when we're going to see sugar from the Commander Sugar Factory. Of course, at the time you were a trade minister. So there was no particular timeline. Nobody had been promised a timeline, and this was not a campaign promise. It was not even in our manifesto. But when I took over as the Minister for Trade and Industry, the sword had been cut mm -hmm. for the construction of a sugar processing factory in Commenda. The factory was actually built three months ahead of schedule. If you're interested in timelines, mm -hmm. those rules have been completed and possibly commissioned as late as October 2016. At the time when people but were describing the president as the commissioner general, that he was just going around commissioning anything and everything, which was even not ready <laughs> just to score political points. No, the, the factory was ready. I'm mm -hmm. saying that the factory was supposed to have been ready in October 2016. Mm -hmm. But the Indian contractors actually completed it on around May 2016. And I think it was about the same time. I don't want to you know, give you wrong information when it was commissioned. So the sugar cane went into the factory in the eyes of more than 20 camera crew from as many media houses. They saw the sugar being crushed. They saw molasses being produced. They saw sugar actually physically coming out. So when people say that the factory never produced any sugar, I, I don't know where the media footage is. So, so where is the can, sugar? Well, the sugar is in the it's in the it's, an, it's in the ground now. It's not the fact is not working, but it's not the NDC government which is in power now. That question you're asking is a very very good question to be asked of the incumbent government because we handed over to them a completed sugarcane processing factory worth about thirty five million dollars. And at the time, based you, on the loan of the Indian government. At the time, so you, their yeah. job was to make sure that the factory works. Just so as you, your father hands over to your property, he wants you to manage Sugar it. was produced under, under your, during your air. Without the slightest question, yes. Hmm. Are you saying you didn't hear this as a no, it's, media it's not about It's not about what you hear or what, what you see. Hey, it's not about what you on camera. But I, I'm saying camera. that personally, and, and, and there were several reports that were done. <laughs> we spoke to indigents in the area as well. Most of them said, well, no jobs to, to start with, no sugar. There's nothing. They had that anything. situation has been created principally by the current government, because we handed to them a sugarcane factory that was operating and that had the latest technology. And I hope they are oiling the machines and maintaining them even if they are not letting it operate. Mm -hmm. But with all due respect, our friends in the NPP have generally had a problem with the, what they inherit from another government. And if you go back to the Nkrumah era, mm -hmm. where Nkrumah left them almost 300 state-owned enterprises, they consciously allowed many of these factories to just collapse, whether it was the Bonsa tire factory, which Firestone had for many years was running, whether it was the Aboso glass factory, which was producing glass. Ghana has not produced any glass, any glass of any kind, mm. for more than 30 years. Whether it was the bust fiber factory in Kumasi, whether it was the shoe factory, whether it was the leather And you're saying plants. they deliberately collapsed them? Well, they didn't believe in Nkrumah. And they also felt that anything Nkrumah did should not be allowed to survive, so his name may die. And they actually passed laws. That if you are seen caught with a book of Nkrumah, any music of, of Nkrumah, any image or effigy or something of Nkrumah, that you, it was a crime. Before the sugar factory itself, the whole process was even started, Imani Ghana, Imani Africa, I must say, came out with a, 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 a paper suggesting that this thing is going to fail. Why should it fail? You see, there's sugar cane that can be grown where we are sitting, almost mm -hmm. anywhere there's a water body including almost all the 1,000 kilometer shoreline of the Kusumbu or the Volta River, you can grow sugar cane. You can grow sugar cane in a huge, vast area of the Fram Plains, in Savelugu in the north, in most parts of southern Ghana, in the South Tongu area. In, and of course, there has been a factory there before. Remember, Commander, the factory was not started there for, by accident. And Kuma already had a factory that was also working in the 1960s. And the difference, though, is that the factory itself, through the state, had its own catchment area of a certain number of thousands of hectares of land, uh, which allowed you to grow the sugarcane on, if you like, government-owned land, so you could harvest it yourself whenever the sugarcane was ripe. The difference in this case is that the government did not have sugarcane farms, so you had to buy the sugarcane from ordinary farmers who normally sold their sugarcane to alcoholic distilleries, uh, distilleries, if you wish. So there was competition for the sugarcane that the government, need, the state, that factory needed to buy, right? Mm -hmm. So that obviously had some cost implications. And then, of course, the water bodies in general in the central and western region, as we all know through Galamse, had been, you know, um, some would say poisoned. Or it made, the water was not good enough for the neighbor, the land around it for cultivation because all the mercury and arsenic matter that goes into the 
you know, processing. So, so we can't blame you for the defunct state of the factory now. You can blame whoever you want, but I'm just saying that the factory is no, there. I, I it's say, not defunct. I, I say, oh, the it's, factory is was, not working. But who is to make it work? I'm not the government. When we were in government, the factory worked. For how, for how many days? It could work for the whole year if you wanted. But sugar cane itself has a season. What, what, when you were in There's government, most agricultural how, how, long, how, long, how long did the... It worked for about three months of, of a three trial. Months. Because and that's then, when sugar cane is available. Sugar cane is available in Ghana, to the best of my understanding, between the months of about October, November, depending on the part of the country, and about March, April. Then most sugar cane gets, doesn't grow. Just as mangoes and avocados and cocoa and most other agricultural produce have a season. So in the agri-industry sector, agri-business sector, everyone knows that when you are building a factory for most agro-processing, mm. the factory will work on a seasonal basis. At the, at the time, you made a projection. You said government was going to make about $20 million from that sugar. How much do you make in that three-month period? I can't remember that oh, figure. I, I remember that figure. No, you may remember it. I don't yes. remember that figure. But, but assuming... How, how assuming, much do you make in the three-month period? Assuming... All those figures are the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Assuming you don't 20 recall? million... No. Did we I make any money? I was the imagine director of the factory, remember? But, but did we make okay. any money at all from that? Well, the if, 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 molasses, if, molasses was sold. The molasses that was produced was sold. The sugar that was produced also was sold. So all those figures are the Ministry of Trade and Industry. And you, you should feel free to go and ask them. Mm -hmm. And the Indian contractors were in charge of that. They handed over the information to the ministry. So, so you don't think... I didn't sell any sugar myself. <laughs> I don't know what was So, so you, don't, you don't think you'll be fair for anyone to say, say you cause financial trial. losses? Listen, it was a trial... It was, well, it was a trial that was done with the factory, right? Mm. When you buy it, even a new car, they tell you don't drive it at top speed. Yes. You, have to, you have to have to let the engine run. For when, you, when you build a new factory yes. for the first three months, you have to try out different components of the factory to make sure that everything is running perfectly before you put it up at full steam. But to put it up at full steam, you need to get a certain quantum of sugar cane. And that is where the challenges were, that the quantum of sugar cane that you needed to run the factory at full throttle was not readily available, or it took a lot of money to buy it since you didn't have your own farm, as I've explained earlier. If the NDC were still in government and the today... The government had not given us one city to go If, if the NDC factory. was still in government today and you were still uh, in charge of that very... The factory uh, would have been running quiet because I did not foresee the government of Ghana running that factory for even two years or, or three years or in perpetuity. Mm. MPP tried to run Ghana Airways, an airline from the, uh, the castle. I wasn't going to do that. So we have put out advertisements for interested investors from all over the world who wanted to take the 70% shares in that factory mm -hmm. to make an offer through Pricewaterhouse. We had received offers, and the company had come forward, was willing to pay $25 million for 75% or 70% ownership of the factory. We left all of that with the new government. That's handing over notes. What they did with those investors, I don't know. But when I met some of them, they said, well, the new government th thought that everything that was done under the new government was for and the previous government the previous wrong. government was to favor one person or the other so they kind of cancelled almost all those processes that were very far advanced this was money for the republic of ghana for the state of ghana and my view was that the government this government should have just taken that money and if they have other investors also fine they can bring any investors that they want to ask them to even merge or, or joint venture in order to get that factory running under private sector management it was not my intention for the Ministry of Trade and Industry to be running a sugarcane factory. Nobody that understands running sugarcane factories. And indeed, in most, most of Ghana, we have not run sugarcane factories for 30 years, so there's not much internal experience. I gather from what you say that you're not very impressed with the performance of the NPP and in particular President of the Republic, Nenado Dangwe Kufado. Is that the case? Well, as far as this sugarcane factory is concerned, the, if I were them and my father handed me any little asset, I would try and grow it or at least maintain it. They haven't done well with the Commander Sugar Factory. There are many other things that they may not have done well. There are many things that they may think they are doing very well. But I think most Ghanaians feel that the, the big promises that they made, and the ones that people can remember, they made more than 200 promises, but the ones that people can remember are the one district, one factory. Mm -hmm. So that is one factory in a district. And if they had at least made sure that that one particular Commander Factory was working, they could have raised the, the flag and said, well, even though this factory was built under the previous government, we are making it work. But, so it but is part of se several other factory. factories have been commissioned. Such as which one? Uh, there was one somewhere in the central region Ekunfi. that was commissioned. There Ekunfi, was a yes. pineapple factory. Yes, a pineapple factory there. Have you seen the bottle, the juice, the package from that factory by any chance? I, I haven't. I, I, I didn't see the sugar the from Commander also. The, yeah, but it's okay. But in, the, yeah. in this case, you can go and check it. Okay. You can go and check so, it. And I'm saying that now the Commander, I mean the Ekunfi pineapple factory ought to be producing. But I saw them 
spending time on farm on trying to produce pineapples. I produce pineapples myself anyway, so I'll be very happy to sell my pineapples to the Kumfi pineapple factory if they are looking for pineapples. But the Kumfi is a fantastic area mm. for pineapple growing. There are more than 1,000 pineapple growers in the Kumfi. I've gone and sat in some of their meetings in the past. So it's a good place for the location. But whether one district, one factory means your factory, you private sector man's factory, the government comes and cloaks the national flag around it and then claims this is one district, one factory. I don't know whether that is. Is that what they are doing? Well, that's what has been done. As far as I know from that factory, I didn't hear that the government of Ghana had any shares, for example, in the factory. It may be that the government is helping the private company to get loans from private banks or from wherever. Is, so that, is that not better than government model, itself burdening, model, burdening itself with all of no, these things? Exactly. I'm we are speaking the same language. Yeah. I didn't say government should be you okay. know, investing in factories. But I'm mm. saying the way it was sold to Ghanaians, most Ghanaians thought the government will come and make sure that there's one district, one factory in each district. Mm. But how they will do that is the business model that nobody knows. The financial model nobody knows. People have gone to the one district, one factory office in cantonments and asked them for the policy framework for the business model, financial model, and there's nothing there. And after one whole year of wasting the people of Ghana's time with that project under that particular ministry, I think it was put under the office of the president. Mm -hmm. One is one factory. It's under the, under the office of the president. Yeah. And I believe it was put under the specific oversight of a certain minister, I think Howard Kumson. Mm -hmm. I think the same ministry that had the 800,000 website story. So quite clearly, there wasn't much happening in that ministry. And everybody was confused. These are the same people who said, we're going to pay two million cities for just budget preparation. I don't know which kind of consultants we're going to hire to help them prepare a budget, which almost any good accountant can do for 20,000 cities. They're going to pay two million cities for it. It's all in their budget. But I'm saying that had they given that project to my good friend Alan Chamatini, the Minister of Trade and Industry, I'm sure he would have known what to do. But this is pro probably internal MPP politics, where sometimes in Ghana we don't want people who are capable of doing something to be given the chance to do it. So you're saying they, they, are, they are not necessarily delivering on the promises the way and manner in which they... Well, if they are they, delivering, you, a very well-informed media person, will mention five places in the northern sector of the country where five dams have been built in the first okay, year. So you choose to focus on the things that have not been done. How about the things that have been done? They promised free SHS. They have started implementing it. The free SHS, I think most parents were hoping that all three cohorts, SS1, SS2, SS3, would have benefited from it. But... After they looked at the cost, which they didn't want to look at earlier, when President Akufado was asked by a BBC interviewer how much it will cost before the elections, he said, well, I can't tell you. I have to go back to Ghana and tell people there. But in Ghana, he couldn't tell us either. In any case, they won the election. They've now discovered this is going to be far more expensive than we imagined. So we can only do the first year. So if you have a, you're a mother or a father with three children in year one, year two, year three, you got upset and angry. They, they came out with a plan. They said they are starting with the first year, and in subsequent years, they were going to spread it to all the other years. So We are waiting on, on them. And I'm saying that first year, when they started, within the first half of the term, and maybe towards the end of the whole term, mm -hmm. the schools had only received 20% of the budget that had been expected. As so things now, we've not heard the schools complain that monies have not been... As the things stand now... The being suspended for apparently... Uh, that, 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 was, that was at the time, of the, of that, the, of the and, and of course, there's intimidation going there's, on. Of course, the ministry so also came out to suggest that the, the ministry came out to suggest that the people were not being suspended or being transferred because of that particular comment they, they, they may have passed. I, I, I do not know what, what really happened. Say, I mean, if you give a, a, a beza or a matron in a school, mm. one CD, 10 pesos for breakfast, one CD, 10 pesos for lunch, one CD, 10 pesos for dinner, for an, a growing child between the ages of 14. And 18. I don't know how much you feed, if you have children, how much you feed them. But children in that age, are they eat quite a bit. Mm -hmm. That three CD, 30 pesos per child, per student, is abysmally low. So ah. parents who could afford to pay their children's school fees, let's remember in Ghana here, there are parents who take their children to some of the well-known, fancy, mm -hmm. so-called international type schools, mm -hmm. where they pay two, three, four, five thousand CDs or dollars a term or a year. And such parents can easily pay a thousand, two thousand CDs for their children's school fees in secondary school. But if you prevent them from paying fees for their own children, then get, they get frustrated. So you think the MPP's free education policy is just, is just a populist move? Oh, it's certainly very populist in the manner in which it was promoted, in the manner in which it was implemented, because if we're all saying that it wasn't thought through, and the budget for it has hovered no, between... I'm not saying that. I just asked many if it's, Ghanians if it's believe so. it, wasn't fell, it wasn't well thought through. Mm. The Ghana Education Service certainly believes that. Most teachers certainly believe that. Most parents certainly believe that. And the MPP itself believes it, because when you tell that Tell us, Ghanaians, that you're not going to establish a separate fund 
for those who want to vo donate voluntarily to help senior secondary schools to put their money in. Did you hear that, co yes, that did. proposal? That is ridiculous. Because I had the privilege and honor by the, God, by the grace of God to establish the Ghana Education Trust Fund, one as many of education. Yeah. And the act of the Ghana Education Trust Fund, the Get Fund Act, actually allows private individuals and institutions to donate towards the Get Fund. Except the Get Fund has not taken advantage of that provision in its law to mobilize additional funds from any, so any number of sources except from the VAT 2.5% that goes into it. And I myself wrote a proposal to them during the Kufu era to help them to raise funds from outside the public purse. And they turned it down and told me to my face at the board meeting that I cannot be asked to do that because I'm an NDC man. And I've come to help the government of Ghana. I've come to help parents in Ghana. I've come to help, help students. And I even said, you don't have to pay me. You can, whatever funds are raised from, for you, you can give me a percentage of it. I mean, if I don't raise any funds, you don't pay me anything. This is the kind of problems that we have in the country where we refuse to tap into the knowledge of any number of people mm. because of the winner-takes-all approach to our politics. And therefore, people who may have various talents, at any particular time, the boat of development of the nation is being rowed by only 50% or less of the population. Actually, I was coming to ask you, I was, I was going are, to ask you about that, uh, this winner-takes-all thing. So, uh, from, from what you say... You think we need to we need a we need a paradigm shift? We need to now begin to look at what an all inclusive government? Well, I don't know whether whether the language will be all inclusive, but certainly there must be ways in which there will there'll be frontline positions. Will you be willing to serve in, will, will you positions. be willing to serve in another Dan Kweku for this government? Now, I think there are ways of serving a country which doesn't have to be in the government. You see, this is the problem. Will you be you willing create, listen, I'm to explain serve. to you. You mentioned one now, thing. I'm serving Ghana already. And How there are many ways I, I can serve my nation. So it depends on what kind of service they would like me to serve. I can serve in As my a nation. Minister? As a minister, that's a frontline position. And so for a frontline position, you must believe in the manifesto of the party that has won the election that is an announcing its ministers. You must be able to sit in a cabinet meeting with that government and agree with most of what they are saying. Or if you want to disagree, you disagree. But because I don't believe in their philosophy, it will be a problem for me to be a minister. But there are many other ways in which uh, a non-MPP person can serve the government and people of Ghana. Which of them would you, would you be comfortable with? I can't nominate my own positions and lobby for it. I'm not interested in lobbying. The position I'm interested in now, as you started this interview, is leading this nation. You speak of a forward agenda. What is it? It's about moving the nation forward, mm. moving our own NDC party forward. Because right. your, we, your party we lost is lacking behind. You are well, once you lose an election, <laughs> you are behind. So it's like a foot, football team. You, become, you can be relegated to... You know the second league or whatever it is, you, or you're at the bottom of the league. You want to lead, you're certainly not, not ahead. You want to sit on the lame horse and think and hope <laughs> that the lame horse can take you to victory. No How does that is, work? No horse is lame forever. The lame horse was somebody else's image. I, my image was that of a car which has had an accident. When cars have accident, they don't sit necessarily in the mechanics yard for forever or for mm. years. There were a lot of criticisms, and uh, a lot of people felt that your leadership at the time from the president himself uh, to the party leadership, most of them did not do such a good job. Your party chairman, the general secretary, most of the national executives, they, they came under a lot of attack. And uh, we are told that portions of the Kosibocho report even captures this. Well, I haven't had the privilege of seeing the report, but it, it's normal in any battle. This is a, this is a political battle. We didn't use weapons. We may have used our mouths and our lips and our promises as the, the, as the battle implements or battle weaponry. Mm -hmm. But in all battles, when you lose, there's blame gaming. And everybody says, this, if this person had done this, this would not have Why do you think the NDC lost? There are many reasons, and it varies from locality to locality. Mm -hmm. In this particular area where we are seated, for example, the people here said that there was a conflict between the member of parliament and the party chairman, the, the, the constituency chairman. They were not collaborating at all, in fact. So there was a lot of so-called skirt and blouse voting, where people may vote for the MP, mm. but vote for another presidential candidate, or vote for the presidential candidate and vote for another MP. All kinds of things happen here. And in every other place you go, you hear different stories. Along the shoreline, the management of pre-mixed fuel was a problem in many parts of the area, so the fishing communities were unhappy with the party. If you go to other regions, you hear about the sense of deprivation. Mm. The water region people felt, for example, that they didn't get some projects that they should have gotten which went to certain other regions, and they, were, they felt they were the World Bank of the NDC, and they should have gotten a greater share of certain particular projects. So you get differences. Then there will always be communication challenges. 
in the view of many of us, the communication message of NDC was more backward looking in the sense of look at what we've done for you. The NDC had a backward message. In the sense, I'm defining it so that you don't get confused. In the sense that the message was looking historically, looking backwards. Look at the projects we we've have done, done for you. We have done that. We've done we that done for this. you in the mm. past. So it was a very, very wonderful green book with hundreds of wonderful projects that ha many governments never were able to do. So very good infrastructure projects by NDC. Health, education, bridges, roads, in that book. But the electorates are fine, so you've done this for us. And we give you the taxes to do it. But what are you going to do for us from 2016 to 2020? So and there was a gap in the In other words, you didn't, you didn't have a message. The message was not um, articulate enough for the future. People are voting for you for what you'll do for them next. What have you done for me lately? That you've done. But what are you going to do for me next was not clear. So Ghanaians didn't think the NDC so had, had was, a vision or had a visionary well, leader the, at the time? The, the manifesto was there. Projects were in it, but it wasn't sufficiently marketed according to what the results were. And people heard the one district, one factory sounded mm. attractive. Mm. One village, one dam sounds very attractive. Free something, something, SHS or whatever is free. People want to go for it. So people saw a Kufado as a more so, visionary leader as compared to John Mahama at the time? Not motivational. There's somebody making wonderful promises. So they said, okay. And, and he was also saying, please try. I've been struggling for the past so many years to be president. He was begging us. Try me and see. But well, those are your phrases. I'm asking. No, I'm, I'm only quoting what he said. Mm. You can now define it. I said, mm. whether it is begging or not, try me and see. So he made all those kind of statements. Apologized to people to here and there. And it was okay. Insecurity has been a big problem under this government in terms of people being raped here, people being killed there, solutions not being found. The, the profligacy, or that's a big word, the, the view that the NDC and the Mama was spending government money through too many appointees. And so people were looking forward to a government that would at least attempt to reduce and restrain itself with regards to public appointments, that is one of the areas where I think N not just people that people are also said people also spoke about the family and friends government John Mahama was running. I don't know who was a particular member of the family was in his government compared to the government that we have now. Kufado is running the family than, and friends where government. More than Twenty members of the family or friends have been identified in the current government. But if you mention one or two names under the Mahama government, fine. So Kufado is, is practicing no member nepotism. of his family was in, his, in the Mahama cabinet as, as I knew. Mm. And um, there may have been one person who is supposed to be a distant niece or something who may have been a deputy minister. That's Bob Mokhtari. That's the one that he himself talked about. So it was not a family and friends government. Now, if people feel that maybe particular projects or particular contracts went to particular individuals who have friends or family, then they can make that case. But no one is saying that if you have a government, it's your enemies, whatever you, you consider, your opponents who will prosper. So quite clearly... I'm going to deal with those. So you don't see anything wrong with that, help, do you? Help you. No, the family and friends in government positions, taking salaries and as appointees, people have a problem with that. Do you have but a problem with I that? I have a problem with that, yes, of course. If you were president, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't appoint people close to you, people you can trust, people no, you know can do the job are, and do it no, well, I, nobody says you have regardless of whether or not no, they, must be close they, to you. They, have, they have blood ties no, they'll to they'll you. Be, they'll be close to you. Well, you have to be circumspect about people who are your blood relatives in public sector positions. And if there are one or two who are necessary for one reason, people may excuse that. I think the pre President Mills, for example, had one of his brothers as a, an economics advisor who would work at the World Bank and therefore had the expertise. Mm. So if he was there as an economic advisor, people will understand that. But if you have a whole platoon of people, now nearly a thousand people in the Flagstaff House, the number apparently will jump to 1,600 in 2018. People are not sure who these people are. How, how differently business. would you run things as president? You have to have a much tighter um, public sector appointment process. And you have to let the growth of the public sector reflect the growth of the economy. Do you think you have what That's it takes to be, do, you, do you think you have what it takes to beat John Mahama? I go into any situation not with a view to beating any particular person. My aim is to win the hearts and the minds of the NDC delegates and let them believe and understand that it is in their interest, especially if they want a two-term president, to vote for me. Others may vote for another candidate. And I don't think any candidate can expect to have, you know, all votes. So everyone hopefully will get some of the votes. You see uh, yourself as the underdog who will likely shock so, everybody. Well, however you like to define me, have the potential to win the DC. 
Blackberry actually plays, and I intend to win it. If John Oama called you today and said, Spio, I want you to step down. Um, I want to run, <laughs> but I want you as my vice. Uh, he hasn't called me to say that. If so, he did that. Well, you are speculating. Yes. I, we can't discuss speculative ideas here. Otherwise, hypotheticals, as we say. Let's wait and cross the bridge where we get to it. But at this time, and based on my the documents in front of you, mm -hmm. since 2006, I've made it known to Ghanaians and to people all over the world that if NDC is looking for a leader, if Ghana is looking for a leader, I am one of many people that they could consider for that leadership. And I think people want to have a choice. When you go to the supermarket, you don't see only one toothpaste sitting on the shelf and then you pick that one. Even if there are seven other toothpaste and that one is the best, the seven will also be there just in case you want your teeth to be whiter or to be brighter or to have a you know, bad breath, whatever it is that people are looking for. Different products offer different solutions. So you go to a, a nightclub or a, a bar or a restaurant, you only see four or five beers or seven wines, even on the wine list, and you choose. So you're saying the NDC delegates, so they, 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 I'm just they opted one for one person. Uh, we saw what happened. They should now opt for someone else, which is you, and you will likely give them something better. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm saying that they must be given a choice. Oh, they, so they have been given a in choice. In the past, they were not. In 2012, we didn't have any contest for the flag bearership. Mm. In 2016, there was no contest for the flag bearership. In 2018, there will be a contest for the flag bearership, and I'm one of the contest potential contestants. Doc, many thanks for your time. Thank you so <laughs> On 21 minutes with KKB, of course, Pio Gabra. Uh, <laughs> he's a seasoned politician, and as you can see, he has uh, the, quite a depth of knowledge and a wealth of experience. He's saying that this time round, he also wants to be president of the republic. Of course. He wants to lead the NDC, and then uh, if he's given the mandate, he can contest whoever it is that the NPP also presents uh, to the table uh, at that very moment. Is uh, your confident of victory? You're going to beat anybody the NPP brings? That is the whole Nane idea. Absolutely, why not? Baumia? It's a one term president. Alan Chemanti? One term MPP. <laughs> one term president. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so <laughs> that, <laughs> Definitely. That, that has been a course, Gabra, on 21 Minutes with KKB. My name is Kwabna Chen Chen I'll see you soon, hopefully, with another guest you are expected.